Good books change people's lives. Now, I'm a book nerd. As I said yesterday, I had a couple of hours to kind of float before I really needed to drive this way, so I landed in Knoxville, and where did I go? Barnes and Noble. I love books, and good books change people's lives. They've always have. In 1511, we are told that during a pilgrimage of Martin Luther to Rome, something happened to him. The Pope was supposed to sort out a conflict between the monks of Germany regarding some technical things that the monks were arguing between themselves. And Martin Luther had been asked by his order to go to Rome and to plead the case of the Augustinian monks with the Pope to present their points of view so that the Pope, of course, would rule in his favor, in, in the favor of, of the order that Martin Luther belonged to. As all good pilgrims do when they arrive in Rome, they are supposed to visit a number of pilgrimage sites. So we are told in 1511 that Martin Luther goes to visit the Sancta Scalia. It is the supposedly the staircase to Pontius Pilate's palace that Jesus would have walked up to see Pontius Pilate and there to be condemned, to be crucified. And while Martin Luther is climbing on his knees this staircase, one step at a time, one, two, three prayers at a time, then you move on to the next step, all of a sudden an insight comes into his mind from a book he had read, The Just Shall Live by Faith. And that insight stunned him. It's not that God is not asking us to, to, do, to be repenting, to, to do works of penance, or to be sorry for the sins that we've committed. Of course, some of the things may be good in their place. But to think that we need to do something in order for God to forgive us is an insight that had not dawned on him. And as he's climbing these stairs and praying step by step, he realizes all of a sudden that no, the forgiveness that we have from God is a gift of God. It is not something we merit by doing things to try to please God. And so he tells us, he gets up, walks down, and does not finish going up the stairs. Good books change people's lives. For him, that was the epistle to the Romans. We back, we forward a few years, a few hundred years, a couple hundred years, and we arrive in London. And there's a man, a pastor by the name of John Wesley. Oh, he's been a missionary to Georgia, this Georgia, where he has tried to convert Indians to the Christian faith. He is an Anglican minister, but he's not successful. He's having all kinds of difficulties, and he does not have a sense of peace, of acceptance, of assurance. He is anxious about his faith. And so he is wandering one night through the streets of London with his anxiety, and he hears singing from a little chapel in the Aldersgate district of London. It's a Moravian chapel, pietist people of German descent. And he enters into the chapel, sits at the back, it's a small place, sits at the back, and there's an elder reading the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. And as John Wesley is listening to the reading of a book's preface, not even the book itself, the preface to the book, he says, my heart was strangely warmed by the words of the gospel that he is hearing, listening to right there that, that evening. Good books change people's lives. For Martin Luther, his insight changed history of Christianity, history of the Western world. For Wesley, the insight changed American history because of the Methodist movement. But things continue. William Miller, we're told, Something similar happens to him. In 1816, he has decided to go back to his church, to his Baptist church. He has not attended for a fairly long time. But he is an educated man. He's been a judge. He's been a sheriff 
for a number of years. And then one day the pastor is not there since he is one of the most educated people in the congregation. People ask him, William, would you read the sermon today? In those days, they read sermons. They picked up a book from the shelf, opened the pages, found a good sermon, and that was the sermon of the day. And so William Miller stands in the pulpit of his little Baptist church in upstate New York, and he begins to read a book of sermons written by some Baptist preacher a generation ago. And as he reads a sermon on Christian education and homes and, and how Christian life should be lived at home, somewhere in the sermon, he's got an insight, and he begins to cry. He understands that God loves him and that God cares for him. And painfully finishes the sermon, but that insight changes his life. He will begin a course of study of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, will come to the conclusion that Jesus is coming soon, and because of that insight that happens to him, there's a little church a couple generations later that is born, one generation later, and that church is the Seventh-day Adventist church. And there's a lady who will hear what he has to say, and her name is Ellen Harmon, and she becomes Ellen White because of the insight that he received that day while he read a book that he had not even wanted to read. Good books change people's lives. What good books have changed your life? Have a, has a book changed your life? For me, that story happens 40 years ago. I am a teenager. I am a nominal Roman Catholic, and I live in Quebec City. That's my accent. I'm a French Canadian. I remember somebody told me last night, you did not tell us where your accent is from. It's from yonder, <laughs> in the French part of this continent, Quebec City. I'm a nominal young teenager. I'm about 15 or 16. And one Sunday afternoon, I flip the channels at home because I'm bored. And uh, I find this TV program is going on. Those of you who are a few old years older than me, you will re recognize this little pamphlet. George Vanderman used to have one like this. And we use this to distribute in mailboxes and to give away. Well, this is the French pastor in Montreal who is taping the It Is Written telecast in Montreal in the same studio that George Vanderman used. George Vanderman, because of Canadian law, had to record his programs in Canada for them to be broadcasted in Canada. Well, he did that in Montreal a couple of times a year. At the same time, there's a French pastor who had translated the program and would do exactly the same thing in the same studio with the same films, and, but a French pastor would do this. So I'm listening to this pastor. I don't know at the time that he's a pastor, Georges Hermans, and I am enthused. I am tickled by what he is saying. I am, I am puzzled. I, I want to know more. I had always been interested in spiritual things. I had been an altar boy for five years approximately. I loved going to church. My grandmother loved going to church and taking us to church. And so I'm interested in these things, but I don't know a great deal about them. So this TV program is really captivating my attention. And so one of these weeks after I get my courage up, again, I'm only 15 or 16, I decide to write a little note to the address that is given at the end of the program asking for a brochure. And sure enough, within a week or two, I get a brochure in the mail. It is one of these Bible studies 40 years ago here coming from amazing facts. It is gaudy looking thing, but it is, it is good. And this Bible study is on the state of the dead. Well, that's interesting, state of the dead. I'm Roman Catholic. A little bit of conflict there. And so I do the Bible study, I follow, it's quite, it's quite easy, I'm a college student, so I love to do these kinds of things, and I, I fill out the Bible study, to, it is just one little page that you tear, and then you mail it back to it is written. And, but at the bottom of that page, of that Bible study, I write a simple question. There's no space to write any comments, but I have one. My question is very simple. 
if we are to accept what you say in this little brochure about the dead, where are the saints? Well, that's a Catholic question. Where are the saints? Saint Joseph, Saint Mary, Saint Vincent, Saint, Saint, Saint who? Whoever. There's plenty of saints. Where are they? No, we pray to people and they're supposed to answer our prayers. Where are they? Good question. A couple of weeks later, there's a knock on my door. It's the evening. You know, it's the days when you could knock on somebody's doors unannounced without calling in advance and it was okay to do this. There's a knock on my door and there's this man, 35, 40 years old or so, and there's a young man with him. There's two of them. Oh, Jehovah's Witnesses. No, he introduces himself as coming from the It Is Written program. And he shows me my, my little note, the pamphlet I had filled out, the Bible study. And he said to me at the door, you asked a question at the bottom of this Bible study. If you don't mind, I've come to answer the question. Okay. Well, you know, in those days, you don't mind a stranger coming into the door. So come on in. We go into the kitchen. We had just finished lunch or supper. And he begins to explain to me, you know, goes over the Bible study on the state of the dead. I'm new to this. I have never done this before. So I don't know what questions to ask. I follow. He's kind. Uh, the, 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 the time together lasts at the most 15 minutes. But just before he leaves, he gives me a little book. He gives me this book. This one, right here. It's the same one. And it's the book Steps to Christ, in French, Vers Jésus. And uh, some of you may have seen it with the same cover, but Steps to Christ, of course. And it was a gift that it is written gave at the time. This is the first Adventist book that I read before I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I've read it many, many times since then. And this is this little book that changed my life. Not necessarily on the spot the first time I read it, but as I read it through the years, because like most of you, I've probably read it many, many times, just like you have. This little book really had a profound effect upon my understanding of the Christian faith, understanding of Jesus, understanding of salvation, God's love for us, as I talked about last night. And this little book really has been with me in my journey as a Seventh-day Adventist for about 40 years now. I was baptized 40 years ago last month. So this little book has been with me all of these years. And what I'd like to share with you this morning, this afternoon, for the remaining few minutes that we have, is a few little statements in this little book that have helped me in my journey as a Seventh-day Adventist, as a young Seventh-day Adventist in the first years that I, was a, uh, that I was baptized, as a young man going to college, being influenced by all kinds of ideas regarding salvation, and how this little book had helped me steer a path through a maze of conflicting ideas regarding salvation. As I talked about last night, that little book begins with a chapter on the love of God, and that is so precious to us as Seventh-day Adventists, is that God loves us wants us in His kingdom, and has done everything in His power to do so, to bring us to Him, to love us, to show us His love through nature, through Jesus, through the Jesus' death on the cross, and our human relationships as well. But it also says, this is a statement we saw last night, last night it also says that it is impossible for us to save ourselves, which is going to be the topic for tonight. So therefore, Something must be done in order for us to be saved. And perhaps the most beautiful thing to realize is that Jesus died for each one of us. That Jesus died on the cross so that we may have eternal life. It is a beautiful concept that Ellen White brings up many, many times here. When I read this little book for the first time, I was young. I was not accustomed to some of the language used in this book because I was a nominal Roman Catholic. Some of the wording is really Protestant wording, not Catholic wording. There are some concepts here that I had never heard about before. So the first few chapters I found a little difficult to read, a little simply. But the last few chapters are very simple chapters. They're about how to grow in Christ. They're about prayer. 
They're about dedicating our lives to God. It is about what to do when you have doubts. Oh, did I ever have doubts? I'm a college student. I'm a nerd. I love books. So therefore, you are exposed to all kinds of ideas. How do you sort them out? Believing in God, trusting in God is a beautiful step in our Christian journey. One thought that impressed me a great deal in this little book that helped me steer myself through my Christian experiences is, is to know that we are just as dependent upon Christ in order to live a holy life as is the branch upon the parent stock for growth and fruitfulness. Apart from Him, you have no life. That was an anchor to me. It was an anchor to me to know that I need to rely upon God, to trust Him, to have faith in Him, confidence in Him, that He cares about me. I don't need to be despondent. I don't need to be discouraged, although sometimes it happens. But we transcend that to know, to believe, to accept that God cares, that God walks with us, that we're not walking alone. Sometimes I felt like I was walking alone, not realizing that Jesus was walking with me as well. But there is one little thing in this little book that perhaps impressed me most when I read it for the first time, and it is on page 70. That's a chapter on sanctification where Ellen White tells her readers how to grow in Jesus, how to have a relationship with Jesus. And there, after she answer, tries to answer the question, how do you abide in Jesus? How, how do you live your life with God? And then she gives a number of suggestions. The first one that she gives, you know, I'm a nominal Roman Catholic. I'm a Roman Catholic. Catholics believe in prayer. They do. Catholics believe in prayer. And they believe in written prayers. It's okay to recite prayers. As a young kid, I learned all kinds of prayers that we had to recite and know by heart. So this lady, this author, which I don't know who she is, is saying here, you want to live with Jesus on a day-by-day -day basis? I said, yes, I do. I want to do that. Catholics want to do that. Well, here's a suggestion. First thing in the morning, consider your life to God. Give your heart to God first thing in the morning when you get up. Let it be your first thought, she says, when you get up. And praise something like this. Take, my, take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. Of course, I learned that in French. And when I read that, I took a little note and I transcribed the prayer and I memorized it. I'm not even going to church yet. I don't even know what Seventh-day Adventists are. But this little book makes a suggestion and it is a good suggestion. When you get up in the morning, pray to God and give your heart to God. So I take a little note, I copy the prayer and I memorize it for years. The first thing I did in the morning was to recite this prayer. First thing, this is what she suggests. In the last few months, I have done this meditation in, in a number of places. I have been surprised to hear how many Seventh-day Adventists have memorized this prayer and also do it every morning. You see, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't emphasize learning prayers by heart and reciting them over and over. We don't even do the Lord's Prayer every Sabbath morning. We're so Protestants. And so here's another prayer, and, and I said, let's do this. A couple weeks ago, I'm doing a devotional at Andrews University, and after I'm done uh, presenting something shorter than this here, uh, one of the staff members comes to see me, and she says, you won't believe this. But now I know where it comes from. My grandmother, who is from a European country, when I was a little girl, she used to say this prayer every morning when we had worship at home in her language. Now I know where it comes from. She got it from Ellen White. Yes, beautiful prayer. So I found that doing this prayer in my own personal journey was a good thing, was an anchor again. 
that in the morning I give my heart, my life to God. Yes, the day may not go as I wish it would go, and I may not be as perfect as I wish I could be, but this prayer becomes an anchor that I know that God will walk with me and that God will be with me during this day. Whatever may happen, He will be there. Beautiful anchor that gave me strength, that gave me courage. And I was pleased to learn a couple pages later that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not an enemy, not an angry God, but a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are and but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to God. You know that I had learned that as a Roman Catholic? My teacher had taught me that this is what prayer is all about. And so when I read that in that little book, I said, yes, that's what I believe too. Beautiful, another anchor for my life. But time is of the essence. We are supposed to uh, go for lunch very soon, and so... Let me, let me uh, skip a number of these quotes to, uh, to share one or two special ones there with you. Let me end uh, with this one. <clears throat> Not everybody understands things the same way when it comes to the plan of salvation. So this quote that I'm going to read with you here is, is not in harmony with what you heard in Sabbath school this morning. Now, I'm not saying that this is wrong or one is better than the other. It's that there are different ways of understanding the plan of salvation. And my understanding of Steps to Christ does not really line up with the Sabbath school teaching this morning. Uh, It doesn't mean that one is right, the other one is wrong. It means that things are perhaps understood differently. So here it is. In like manner, you are a sinner. You cannot atone for your past sins. You cannot change your heart and make yourself holy, but God promises to do all this for you through Christ. You believe that promise. Most of the passages in the book Steps to Christ, as I'll explain this afternoon, come from sermons of Ellen White that had been published before and are brought together in this little book. And in the sermons of Ellen White, there is therefore an appeal that she talks to people. She invites people to make decisions. She is engaging the congregation. And this is one of those. And so hear the tone here. Hear the conversational tone of Ellen White. God promises to do all that needs to be done for you through Christ. You believe that promise? You you believe this? You confess your sins and you give yourself to God You will, you desire, you decide to serve Him. Well, just as surely as you do this, God will fulfill His word to you. If you believe the promise, if you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed. God supplies the fact. It's not the fact before. Sorry. It's not a fact before. It is a fact when you believe the promise. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, when at that moment you do this, then you are cleansed and forgiven. You are made whole, just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk when the man believed that he was healed. It is so if you believe. I hear the invitation of Ellen White here. I hear the invitation to us to have that kind of relationship with God and with Christ, to follow Him, to invite Him to be our Savior, and us also giving our lives to Him because we just can't save ourselves. That's just impossible. But Christ will supply the fact when we give ourselves to Him. The book Steps to Christ has been to me just an anchor, just to guide me through my journey. And I know that many, many of you also have read it through the years, and it has been a blessing to all of us for 125 years. It is a beautiful book, a book that changed my life and continues to change myriads of peoples. We are told the book has been translated in approximately 160-some languages, which means millions and millions and millions of copies have been distributed. The book, I believe, is about one thing. 
If there is one sentence, one question that the book is really about, it is this one. Who has the heart? To whom does it belong? Does it belong to you? Or does it belong to God? It's a beautiful little book that tries to f help us focus on what that decision ought to be for us. So as we conclude, may I invite you for our blessing and our benediction this afternoon. May I invite you to recite with me this prayer. I think it is appropriate as we think a little bit as to what that book perhaps has meant to, to some of us and our own spiritual journey with God, I think it is appropriate perhaps to, to go back to a very basic thing. And the basic thing is to give our hearts to God. This is what this little book is really all about. Now, this is not the Steps to Christ version. This is the Step to Jesus version. So it sounds a little bit more modern, and the King James tone has been removed and put it uh, in a little bit more of a modern uh, language. May I invite you just to stand with me as we conclude? And let's recite together this prayer to God here as our concluding prayer uh, for our service here this morning. Take me, O Lord, as wholly yours. I lay all my plans at your feet. Use me today in your service. Live with me and let all my work be done to honor you. May this be our prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.